Hi everyone, can all of you hear me? Okay, great, great. I see a few thumbs up right now. Okay, so a very good afternoon to everyone. All right, welcome to Virtus Fertility Center, Singapore's virtual meeting. And thank you so much for um, spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Uh, my name is Stephanie, your virtual MC for today. All right, so um, before we start, uh, may I actually invite all of you to um, kindly unhide your screen, please, because um, our speakers would really love to see all of you and make this virtual meeting, you know, more intimate and more interactive at the same time. Okay, so yeah, and uh, I have also, um, I'm also uh, muting all of you so as to keep the meeting conducive for everyone. All right. Okay, so um, to start off, right, we have with us four very highly experienced professionals who will be sharing useful information with all of you today. Uh, Q&A will ensue at the end of the fourth presentation. So for any burning questions that you may have in between um, the speaker's presentations, right, uh, feel free to submit them through the chat option uh, over here in Zoom. Okay, and um, our presenters will try their very best to address as many of them as possible during the Q&A session, which is slated at 4 p.m. Okay, so far so good. All right, so um, without further ado, um, I shall invite our first presenter of the day, Ms. Sharon Lim, fertility coach and counsellor, who will be sharing with you on navigating stress during the fertility journey. Ms. Lim, please. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very nice to, to um, be around and just share with you what we do at Virtus uh, to support couples who, who come through Virtus because we realize that, um, you know, IVF or your fertility journey can be incredibly stressful and quite lonely. So, so I think we're quite unique in Singapore in having a team of dedicated coaches uh, attached to Virtus uh, and every couple who comes through the door at Virtus uh, meets one of us at least once, uh, usually more as kind of part of your intake. So I've got a, a short deck of slides here that I'll take you through. Uh, let me see, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Perfect. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, there's my name. I'm one of the coaches at Virtus. So, very short agenda, uh, just touching on some of the factors that couples have shared with us uh, over the years uh, about what causes them the most stress when they're trying to start building their families. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about why it's so important to manage stress for your health and well-being. A few short tips, and then I'll just finish off by summarizing our kind of points of contact with you should you choose to come to Virtus. So some of, these are some of the things, you know, these bullet points that couples have shared with me over the years uh, when I've been supporting them at Virtus. Um, obviously, it's, it's a, the fertility journey can be very difficult. It can be a long one for some couples where there's very little control over the outcomes. So that can be tough. There's also a bit of an, a, a monthly emotional roller coaster, right? So, so every month you're hopeful and then you're disappointed and then you have to pick yourself up and keep going. So it's a journey that requires a lot of stamina and resilience on, on the part of, of you parents to be. Other reasons, uh, Googling, you know, looking for answers. Uh, your, our brains are always kind of set to look for answers. And we can't, if we can't get answers or straight answers, it tends to make us feel a bit more anxious. Some of you might have medical reasons for the block in, in conception. Some of you may not have any explainable reason at all. And both of those options can also add to your questions and your stress and anxiety about things. So, and, and we know that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves, perhaps there's family pressure to start a family. Um, you know, seeing other people's babies can make us feel sad. And it's a, it's a very lonely private journey for many people, you know, so this, this, it's difficult to confide or to find other couples who may have been through the same journey to, to kind of find facts and get support. Uh, and of course, you know, that there, there can be marital tensions that build up as needs change and ideas change about starting families and how to do that. And women often worry as well, if they're working women about, you know, if I do IVF, how do I balance that with, with the commitment that I also need to make to, to 
the fertility process, the IVF process as well. You know, what about appointments? What about medications, et cetera, et cetera. So, so some of these are the things that I discuss very openly and confidentially with couples. And I try and um, share experiences of other couples and give tips and advice about how to manage some of these things. And I'm sure that uh, many of you listening in now will have experienced some or all of these. And that's completely normal, by the way. So let me talk about stress just a little bit. So we know that stress sometimes is good, right? So stress keeps us alive. Stress keeps us out of danger. Stress helps us to escape dangerous situations. It gets us out of bed in the mornings to go to work. So in the short term, that is the function of stress and why we've evolved to have these episodic stress things. Um, but what happens to our bodies when we feel stress? We've all been there, right? When we feel nervous or we're about to go on stage and talk about something and we have stage fright or we're about to go for surgery or somebody drives dangerously and frightens us, we, we get an instant increase in stress hormones, which leads to our blood pressure, our heart rates and, and going up. We can feel our hearts pounding in our chest. We might feel breathless. We might have a feeling of panic. So that's a, an instant stress response. And, and this is what we call, and it can lead to, to this fight, flight, or freeze, right? Do you run? Do you stand your ground and flight, fight? Or do you, uh, maybe like me, you're like an ostrich, you stick your head in the ground and pretend nothing's happening. So, so that's what we call an acute stress response. The problem, though, comes if we're under chronic stress. So. This is the kind of stress where we might not be sleeping very well. You know, we don't sleep well for several weeks or months. Or we have a very poor work culture, uh, which causes us a lot of stress. Uh, or financial problems, for example. And of course, being on a, a longer fertility journey month after month can also lead to chronic stress. So these are where your, your body's responses are really inappropriately stress all the time, your hormones are a little bit out of balance. And, and this affects us body and mind, right? So uh, people describe when they're feeling stress, they might get anxious more easily, they're irritable, they might not sleep, and they might get headaches, they can't focus very well. Uh, and obviously, chronic stress can also lead to health problems like, you know, high blood pressure or obesity or uh, just changes in behavior which are not very helpful. And unfortunately, once you kind of get into a chronic stress cycle, uh, unless you're very aware, you can kind of get stuck in that rut, right? So if you're very stressed, you stop sleeping properly, you stop eating properly, you stop exercising and so on. And that can kind of feed on itself. So really the aim when I work with couples who come to Versus is, is to try and find some kind of balance, right? To, to balance the stress of work, the stress of IVF, uh, and how do you counterbalance all that stress with, with healthier things and a different way of looking at things so that you can navigate the IVF journey uh, much more calmly with a sense of control uh, and more healthily as well, which is important. So the first thing I always say to anybody dealing with stress and anxiety is that you need to build your buffer, right? So if you think about the little core of yourself inside and, and all the stress that's attacking you all the time from different directions in our current modern day lifestyle. One of the ways you can make yourself more resilient to stress, meaning uh, you can deal with more stress before it really affects you badly. You can bounce back after disappointment, pick yourself and carry on. That's resilience, right? To recover, figure it out, carry on. One of the ways to do that is actually to build what I call our buffers around us to protect us so that it requires a lot more stress before we're very badly affected. And it's actually very simple. You know, to look after your body and mind is the foundational way of building your buffer against stress. And it's really these points here. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you exercising regularly? Are you eating well? Are you looking after your, your mind, body, and spirit, right? Are you maintaining important relationships in your life? Because there are people in our lives that give us energy, that give us calm, that give us a safe place to go to. 
Uh, same with hobbies, you know, relaxing hobbies. And, and then finally, of course, a spirit. And spirit can mean many things to many people. It could be religious or, or it may not be. Uh, or it could just be having the sense of being part of a world and uh, there's something bigger than yourself. So it's important, I think, uh, for, for a lifetime, not just for IVF, to be, to be very aware of what's stressing you, but also to also consciously always counterbalance that by doing these things, looking after these things and making the time for these things. So, you know, I, I kind of think of my life in stress and, and am I spending most of my time in my emergency room or am I spending most of my time in my healing room? And really to be realistic, it, it's really always, you know, having enough time in the healing room to recover, rejuvenate and face the world again. So, so bear this in mind because if you're always in your emergency room, you lose track, right, of what's happening and you don't even realize that you're in a very bad situation unless someone says, hey, you know, what's going on? So, so just a few tips, right? So if you ever feel acutely stressed for any reason, um, you know, you've just had some bad news perhaps, or um, you get really angry with somebody when you're driving because they cut you up and they've been really dangerous and you just kind of want to chase them and start honking your horn. If you suddenly feel that kind of rush of anger or stress, the first thing you can do is actually to just take a couple of deep breaths, right? The only anti-stress signal that our brains, our only physical anti-stress signal that our brains understand actually comes from our diaphragms at the bottom of our lungs. So, you know, a couple of deep breaths and activating your diaphragm, that's connected to your inner brain through your vagus nerve. That immediately kind of resets your brain, makes you feel a bit calmer so that you can, you know, your conscious thought can come back and say, actually, is that something I need to get worked up about? You know, or, okay, just take a deep breath, calm down, and then I, I can kind of figure out what to do. So, so breathing is always good, right? Even if you're not feeling stress, that's why we use breathing as a form of relaxation exercise as well. So don't forget to breathe, you know, don't, don't kind of pull up your shoulders and hunt yourself and not expand your lives. So have a good posture, breathe well all the time, and don't forget to take a couple really deep breaths when you're feeling incredibly stressed or emotional. It'll help. The second thing, which is a bit harder to do, is uh, I, I call it making room for anxiety. So, so IVF is a stressful process, right? And, uh, and it can cause anxiety in people, and there's just no escape from that, right? So I'm not going to tell you to not feel anxious or to not feel stressed. It's, it's kind of part of the process. So I've talked about, okay, how do you make yourself a little bit more resilient? And those were those kind of six circles. But, but there's another kind of thing you can do, which is to kind of make room for anxiety, right? You can, you can train yourself to accept that stress and anxiety is part of life. Um, but really, how do we make room for it in our brains and our hearts so that we're a little bit more comfortable with it and we can continue to function in the way that we want to function even though we're feeling a bit stressed and anxious. But this one is, is the one that takes a little bit more thought and perhaps, you know, talking to someone like myself. But some of you might intuitively do this anyway and, and understand what I'm talking about. So, so this, this concept of not trying to get rid of anxiety, but making room for it and may, maybe learning how to push it to the back of your head. So there's this little cloud that's perhaps floating around in the, in the back of your head from time to time. It becomes big and black and comes forward. But you know, over time you get used to this little cloud being there in the background and, and, it, and it's normal and it shouldn't stop you from doing what you need to do, you know, going to work or thinking about your diet for that day or going for a bit of exercise. So make room, make room for anxiety. Don't fight it, drop the struggle, just be a little bit more comfortable with it. And then this third one is very important when you're going through IVF. So you need to communicate with your partner, right? Both of you want to be parents and that's why you're here. So, so always communicate clearly about what you need before, during, after IVF. Um, 
you know, be very clear, just touch base every now and then about, you know, is this still our goal? Is this still what we want to do? Is this the right way to do it? You know, so, so just keep talking. But a lot of couples who go through IVF also feel very stressed um, when other people ask them about it, right? So aunties or relatives or what do I tell my colleagues at work if I have to sneak off one morning to have some ultrasounds or to pick up my drugs or to have a procedure. So the point is you guys figure out what you want to tell other people. It could be nothing or it could be something. It could be a white lie. It really doesn't matter because this is your business, right? It's nobody else's business. But make sure that both of you are totally aligned about what you're going to say to whom. So, so it's very clear. And, and then that's it, right? And other people can just go away and mind their own business. So, so you, are in the, in, in, you should be in the pilots, the driver's seat here, about how much you want to share with other people and who. Um, so, so, you know, this is an important point. Usually we, we know what people might ask us. So prepare for it, you know, so that when that question comes, uh, you're not going to be really upset. You know, if someone says to you, oh, you know, so, so when are you two going to start a family, right? And, and that can be a very upsetting question from well-meaning people. Um, just, just anticipate these things and prepare for them. Have, have an answer ready that you both agree on. And then just, you know, almost finally, just a few other little things, right? So, so these things are really things that uh, you can do when you're in your, in your healing room, right? So I showed you the slide about the emergency room and the healing room. So, so what is the healing room? What are the things that you can do to counterbalance stress? Basically, anything that makes you feel good or relaxed or reassured, anything that is for yourself, and only for yourself so that you don't feel like you're doing it for someone else it can be very very therapeutic so different people are different right so so figure out what helps you you know maybe confiding in a friend a trusted friend can be helpful maybe you've got a very relaxing hobby maybe you like massages or facials uh, maybe you like music or meditation so so have make sure you have two or three things that you can go to to maintain your well-being, whether you're feeling stressed or not. Make sure it's part of your life, of your balanced life that you're aiming to build. So, you know, just, just to kind of top tips as you think about starting your IVF journey is just know what are the things that stress you, right? Know what stresses you. Know that it's perfectly okay and normal to feel stressed and anxious. But, you know, choose two or three ways, you know, some, I've given you some ideas that can help you reduce your stress so that you can continue to function the way that you want to function, right? From time to time, you might feel very upset or angry or disappointed or anxious. That, that's okay. But the goal here is, is really what I really want to do is help you maintain your resilience so that you can continue if you want to. Right? And, and, and give you also sources of information that might help. Uh, so I already talked about spending more time in your healing room and the importance of having good communication between the two, the husband and wife, uh, but also maybe other key people. And this final thing is about rehearsing your mind for success, right? So please don't start IVF thinking that you're gonna fail already, okay? You know, just, just start IVF more of, uh, I, I use more of an athlete's kind of mindset. You know, I, I start a race expecting to cross the finish line, right? And I know in this particular situation, it's a little bit harder because we can never guarantee you an outcome. But what you want to do is take it day by day and every day maximize your chances of success. So, so you do the right things, you know, have the right conversations with your doctor, uh, ask your doctor if you're not sure about things and make sure you're doing things right. You know, make sure you're eating well and exercising and sleeping. So, so those things are all very, very important because honestly, you know, well-being and health kind of equals fertility. So, so if you want to increase your fertility and your chances of success, then focus on your well-being. And, and those are the things to kind of steer your energy towards during this stressful time, really. So finally, um, just tell you what we do at Virtus. So 
it, when couples come to Virtus, we, we have two uh, definite touch points with them. So, so the first one is um, before um, what we call the, the, the kind of um, egg retrieval phase. So, so this is when, uh, and you'll hear more about it later on, but, but uh, when a woman has hormones to stimulate uh, egg production in her ovaries, we like to see you before that happens, right? To prepare both of you for, to, so you know what to expect, um, answer any questions that you can from all of us, from the team at Virtus, uh, how to manage the stresses, the challenges, the balance with work and so forth, and how you can support each other as you embark on this program. We also see you when the women come back to have their embryo transfer, you know, the second phase. Um, so this is where the embryo is transferred into the woman's uterus, and then there's a two-week waiting time um, to see whether that embryo transfer has worked. So from a procedural perspective, for the second phase, the embryo transfer is fairly straightforward and very quick, but uh, for many women, they find that two-week waiting time very emotionally difficult, right? They get very anxious because they, 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 they want to know what the result's going to be and whether this embryo transfer has worked. So we see you at the time of embryo transfer to kind of talk about, you know, ways to relax when you're feeling very tense or anxious um, and, and to kind of manage expectations. So, so that's when we see it versus, and uh, that is how we try at a, at a, a minimal level, try and support you uh, should you come uh, to, to, to Virtus. So I hope that helps and uh, I'll be around if you have any questions uh, later on towards the end of this afternoon session and uh, maybe I'll see some of you in due course. So Stephanie? Right. All right. Done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Lim. Okay. I hope all of you have actually, you know, learned some valuable tips from her. And uh, really, I can't agree more that success starts in the mind. All right. <laughs> so once again, if let's say you have got any burning questions, uh, do share them under the, the chat option here in Zoom. And uh, at the end of the fourth presentation, we will uh, try our very best to answer as many questions as possible. All right. Good. Okay. So, um, before that, right, uh, before I actually move on to inviting the next speaker, can I actually invite all of you to kindly um, unhide yourselves, please? Yeah, because really, our speakers would really hope to see all of you in order to make this virtual meeting more um, uh, intimate, interactive, and meaningful as well. Yeah, so if you are okay, I uh, would like to invite all of you to actually unhide yourselves on screen. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, and uh, next up, let us invite uh, Dr. Liao Suilian, our Scientific Director of Virtus Fertility Center Singapore, who will be sharing with you on factors that influence the outcome of IVF, sperm, oocytes, and IVF laboratory. Dr. Liao, please. Good evening. I'm going to share some slides with you. Maybe, uh, just give me a moment, please. Steve, uh, Stephanie, uh, just uh, one oh. moment. Yes, um, no problem. Yeah. Okay. And meanwhile, for the rest of the participants, um, please feel free, you know, to actually throw in all of your questions to us. All right, you can actually drop it publicly to everyone or you can actually drop it uh, pub uh, privately to myself as well, okay? And uh, of course for Zoom, right, we also have got that reactions um, icon. So at any point in time, if you, if you agree with something or anything, feel free to drop any emoticons to us because we want to make this virtual meeting as interactive as possible, all right? Thank you.
Okay, I think right now, um, Dr. Liao is still in the midst of um, um, preparing to share his deck. Okay, uh, that might there might be some um technical um issues going on. Um, so just wanted to check whether so far so good. Anyone has anything to share with regards to um the first presentation by Miss Sharon Lin? Able to actually drop any comments or feedback or question, you know, via the chat option. Okay, you can actually send it to me or uh, publicly to everyone. Yeah. And then so that I can actually address them accordingly after um, the end of the four presentations. Yeah, I think all of you are very shy. <laughs> I think other than myself, no one is actually showing yourselves. <laughs> Okay, please give us a moment. Thank you so much for your patience and uh, also for spending your lovely Saturday afternoon with us. Okay, um, and uh, to share with the rest of you, we are hoping to finish by um, not more than 5 p.m. for today. All right, the deck is ready. So, Dr. Liao, please. So sorry about uh, the ten some technical problem. Okay. Um. Um, Doctor Liao, I think your screen is quite um unclear. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. That looks fine now. Yeah. Okay. Looks fine. Yeah. Yeah, this one, I don't have the spikes here. Can't go in. So basically, uh, just to share with everyone, so Dr. Liao's presentation will really be very interesting because he will be sharing with all of us on the signs behind IDF, all right? Can go to this one. Interesting. Not here. Okay. Oh. Just close this one. Okay. Open this one. Thank you, Matthias, for your feedback for uh, Miss Sharon Lim. I can't see my slide then. I can't see my own slide. How do you go up there? Okay, and uh, wait, uh, you just help me a bit more. I can't see my own slide. How do you open up there? So sorry about it. I can't see my own slide. How do you do that? Just now you pause the Oh, no, 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 I can. Uh, okay, do this one. Okay, so sorry about the, some technical things. Uh, I'm still learning how to use Zoom. <laughs> okay, um, for today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what are the factors that affect, of course, the outcome of IVF, and you know, it's the sperm and the eggs and the IVF laboratory. So, first of all, my slides here. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this slide, but I just want to go through with you uh, this slide so that you understand how an IVF laboratory works, okay? Now, what you see here, this is the ovary, this is the fallopian tube, and this is the uterus here. So now, naturally, when a woman ovulates, the egg will be sucked into the tube, and 
the husband will deposit the sperm in the vagina here, and the sperm will have to swim all the way to fertilize the egg. So fertilization happens within the tube. Now, once the embryo, once egg has been fertilized, it's known as an embryo, and this embryo will take five days to reach the uterus. So it, during this five-day journey, it grows more and more cells. By the time it reaches the uterus, it has become a very specialized embryo known as the blastocyst. This is how it should look like. Now, why is it so specialized? Because you look at it, there's two distinct cell groups of cell groups within the embryo. So this one block of cells here become, will become the baby. And this network of cells here will give rise to the placenta. So the aim of the, of the lab is to grow your embryos to the blastocyst stage. Why? If the embryo could reach the blastocyst stage, that means it's robust. And we transfer this stage of embryo, there's a high chance of you getting pregnant. Now, coming back to this one here, what, what I'm trying to impress on you is that the IVF laboratory will try to optimize the conditions that are found in the fertile tube and the uterus in terms of temperature, humidity, air quality, and the embryologists who handle your egg and embryo with tender loving care. So, I, so and in analogy, the lab is just like the fallopian tube and the uterus. Now, Fertilization, as you, as you know, is a union between a sperm and the egg to create an embryo. And on the left side, what you see is a human egg. Now, the size of a human egg is just a full stop on your, on your page. Yeah? And what you see here now is a an human egg uh, that is, uh, has been uh, magnified 5,000 times, which looks like a, a tennis ball. Yeah? And if you extrapolate this, you see that the sperm is attaching on the surface of the egg before it fertilize, penetrate and fertilize the egg. Now, what do we have to do to make IVF successful? As I mentioned, the egg and the sperm plays a very important part in, uh, in uh, giving you a good outcome. So first of all, of course, in uh, IVF, we need to select a healthy sperm. And also, of course, the doctor will try to get healthy eggs from you and the embryologist will try to will try to fert will fertilize this sperm the egg with the, with the husband's sperm and grow the embryos and from there uh, with a cohort of embryo there is a selection of embryo to choose the best embryo to put in so that it can give you a good outcome now the laboratory place also also plays an important role here because as i mentioned earlier the environment should be a stable environment, meaning the temperature, the humidity, and it should be a non-toxic environment, meaning there shouldn't be any uh, gases or volatile organic compounds that are found within the, the lab that can contaminate the air, and that also will affect the uh, outcome of the embryo quality. So what are the factors that are important in success? As I mentioned, sperm and egg. So first of all, We'd love to talk, we'd like to talk about the sperm. Now, for your information, um, the sperm itself, when you are uh, in the school days, the teacher will have told you that the job of the sperm is just to get in to the egg, to fertilize the egg, and that's it, yeah? But there are a lot of medical evidence that show now that the sperm has a major role on deciding a healthy pregnancy as far as the first three months of pregnancy. So. Choosing a sperm is very critical in our uh, IVF practice. Now, what you see here is a normal shaped sperm. So, so the sperm will have a cap that contains the enzyme that helps the sperm to, to penetrate the egg shell and fertilize the egg. And the egg contains the male DNA. The neck itself is the powerhouse. Yeah? And the tail is just to help the sperm to swim towards the egg. Now, this is just a diagrammatic way of showing, that's how I explain it. So what happens is that there's thousands of sperm that reach the egg, surrounding the egg, then they penetrate through the eggshells. Before they penetrate, they have to release the enzyme so they can drill a, drill a tunnel through the eggshell and later on fertilize the egg. But unfortunately, not every sperm will have such good shape. 
Yeah. So in in those those men who have sent the sample for testing, if you look at the morphology, the report they said morphology one percent, two percent, or three percent. That means that that percentage will indicate to you what how many percent of your sperm had normal shape. Yeah. So what do we know? A man has a good sperm or not? So these are the minimum. Uh, these are parameters. Uh, that WHO 2010 has published. So we follow these uh, parameters. In terms of sperm concentration, as long as the sperm concentration is more than 15 million per meal, there is a possibility that the man can uh, make her partner pregnant. Mortality, the mortality describes how many percent of the sperm are moving forward. So minimum requirement is 32% of the sperm population. Vitality means, uh, how many percent of the sperm are alive when you ejaculate? Because not every sperm would be alive when you eject in the ejaculate. So minimum about 60%, and the shape is about minimum 4%. Yeah. Now, what about the health of the of the sperm, which I mentioned? What you saw here, here in this slide, this just tells you the quantitative analysis of the sperm. How many sperm was how many percent of the sperm in normal shape and so on and so forth. But what we are now more interested in is the quality of the sperm in terms of this DNA. So now, as we are aware, we are always you know being exposed in environment uh, uh, in the impurities from the environment, from the food, water, and air that we take in every day. So all these impurities would cause damage to the sperm when it enters the, our body system. So what could have effect of this sperm damage to this, uh, on, the, on the embryo quality? First of all, if the sperm has badly damaged DNA and is fertilized into the, in, uh, by, uh, and it fertilized the egg, and of course the egg in a way also can try to, dam try to repair the damaged DNA in the sperm, but if the da damage of the sperm, the, the DNA that is present uh, there is damage in the sperm, it's very, very bad. The egg can't correct all the mistakes and that will give rise to poor quality embryo. And even let's say the, the embryo managed to reach blastocyst and the woman gets pregnant, then that the high risk of miscarriage can happen. Yeah. Now, this slide shows you uh, four sperm that have been uh, badly damaged by the uh, ox free oxygen radicals that, uh, that the person is exposed to. Now, what you see here is that the dark matters are the DNA material. So when the free oxygen radicals or impurities go into the bloodstream and they damage the sperm, you see uh, the empty spaces in the head. All right? So number one, number two, and number four shows you that this sperm had badly damaged DNA. And the, the number three is minimal. So in other words, the, the egg has no issue correcting this sperm. DNA, but you cannot correct all these mistakes from the first uh, from one to a four uh, sperm. Now, what you see here are an example of two embryos that have been fertilized by sperm that have badly damaged DNA. All right, so it's, it doesn't even look good and cannot even reach the blastocyst for implantation. Yeah. Now, Inverters, we do, uh, other than semen analysis, we also perform uh, DNA testing of the sperm, looking at how many percentage, what's the population of sperm that uh, are good in terms of DNA and how many percent of the sperm are damaged. So what, one of the tests that, test, uh, that you will be used for testing uh, sperm DNA fragmentation is known as the halo sperm. Now, what happens here is this. So when you submit a sample, a small volume of the sperm sample will be put on a slide, treated with chemicals to break down the cell membrane so that the DNA of the sperm is spread out like this. So, so this is known as the halo. So what it means is that the larger the halo, the better it is. Now, these two, this view here, one here, and shows you that more than 50% of this DNA has been damaged. And this one shows you that these are the dead sperm. So what happens in the lab? The lab will look at a percentage of sperm that had small halo 
plus a percentage of sperm that had no halo to give you the DNA fragmentation index. So if your reading falls between 1 to 50 percent, that means your, 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 your sperm are okay, the quality is okay, there's a good potential to produce a good pregnancy. But as the percentage of DFI goes up, then of course the quality of the embryo uh, uh, of the sperm drops and then there's a, there's a risk of uh, producing embryos with poor quality. Yeah? Now, how do we overcome this in the lab? Now, we have been doing this uh, for many, many uh, years now. What we do is that we select sperm using very high magnification. And this, this uh, procedure is known as IMSI, IMSI. Now, what you see here are sperm with very high magnification, and you can see sperm having holes. If we see sperm with holes like this, that means that this sperm have badly damaged DNA. We are not going to use it. So we're going to spend some time looking for a healthy looking sperm to fertilize the egg. This is to help to reduce the burden of, on the egg to repair the DNA and also to increase the chance of getting a healthy embryo and a healthy pregnancy. Now, there's a difference between ICSI and IMSI. Yeah? Now, ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection uh, plainly said that it means that injecting a single sperm into the egg. Now, this is uh, the, the uh, conventional method of fertilizing the, the egg with a single injection of a sperm called ICSI. Um, where's my... Okay. Now, what you see here in the picture here is the same sperm but magnified uh, with different magnification. Now, the 400 times is the standard magnification for ICSI. So what you see here, and you see the sperm at 400 times, you, are, you don't see much detail of the sperm. So the embryologist you, you're doing ICSI may miss out some damaged sperm and inject that sperm into the egg. And in the end, the embryo quality may be affected. But in, in IMSI, IMSI, what happens is this. The embryologist will select a few of the sperm at 400 times line them up like a beauty contest and I magnify them to 1,200 times so that we can see more details of the sperm. So as I mentioned, the head of the sperm contains the male DNA. If I see holes present on the head, that means that this sperm DNA is badly damaged. We were not going to use it and fertilize the egg. Now, even let's say this sperm had no holes at all and assume that this sperm had a good DNA. But the neck is defective. It looks like there are, two, there are two horns here. We will also reject that. In other words, we're going to find a handsome looking sperm to get into the egg. All right? So that helps to, to increase the uh, chance of getting a good embryo and a good pregnancy. Now, what about men with no sperm in his sample? Now, there are uh, uh, what we call the condition, if you, you can't find sperm in the ejaculate, that condition is known as azospermia. Now, there are two types of, uh, of uh, azospermia. One is known as the obstructive azospermia, or another one is non-obstructive. Obstructive means something there's a blockage in the sperm duct that the sperm can't, uh, can't, uh, can't get out, can't be produced, can't be ejaculated out of into the into the, out, into the outside surrounding. So what happens is it could be because of a history of vasectomy, where the sperm duct is cut, or it could be the sperm duct, part of it has become uh, fibrous and, and impede the, the sperm from getting out, or some men are born without a sperm duct. All right? So in this situation here, the sperm production is normal. The only thing that you, the, for, for the doctor to do the doctor will just have to go in and get sperm from the testicular tissue and you can fertilize using that sperm to fertilize the eggs. Now, in, in this one, non-obstructive azospermia, what it means is that you have the presence of that and everything is normal, but as because of the uh, uh, deficiency of sperm production in, in the testicle, the insufficient sperm in it, but this one can also, we have to go for surgery to take the testicular tissue out 
look at the sperm, and then from there, all these tissues can be frozen. The spectacular sperm can be frozen and can be used for many cycles. There are many egg collection cycles, many IVF cycles in the future. Um, just to summarize, a simple sperm count is only a screening test, as I mentioned before. The sperm concentration, the motility, and all this. But sperm DNA damage has a serious effect on the IVF outcome. And sperm DNA fragmentation assay is a qualitative test and fertility can be achieved with testicular or epididymal sperm. Yeah? Um, let's talk about the egg. Now, we have been doing a lot of sperm and in, in getting good results from the sperm. Now, we also, from this, in fact, in the beginning now, we are looking at the eggs more thoroughly, selecting the eggs. We, because we believe that if you start with good egg and good sperm, you will expect a better outcome. So now, as you are aware, a woman, when she is uh, born, uh, in fact, before she is born, she has been given a fixed number of eggs. That's why the egg is as old as the woman. Yeah? So a small every month, a small number of eggs will grow and only one is released. All right? So now, what happens is this, the, you know, from the egg is derived from a, a cell that has 46 chromosomes. So to be able to be fertilized by a sperm, the egg have to throw away half the number of the chromosome. That means 23 will be gone. The other 23 will be retained so that the sperm can also contribute 23 chromosomes to fertilize the egg so that the embryo will have 46 chromosomes that makes a human being. Now, occasionally, when the eggs uh, have been retrieved from the patient, from a woman, we may find eggs that are not healthy, one or two. Right? But some nowadays it's quite rare, just to reassure you. What we can see, some the egg can be have a thick egg shell or egg with holes. Egg with holes means this egg is degenerating, it can't be used. Or a Mickey Mouse looking egg or egg with some inclusions. So if the lab have come across this type of eggs, we will not use them because the resultant embryos will be genetically abnormal. Yeah? Now, as I mentioned, we are now also selecting eggs for, uh, for, for IVF or XC for insemination. Yeah? Now, you look at this picture. In fact, nowadays, 99% of the time when you grade the egg or the embryo, it is done by visual grading. So when, when I look at this egg here, it looks very healthy. But to me, I'm more interested in the internal structure of the egg. That means this one here. This one, this, what you see here, the line here, these are the 23 chromosomes that the egg retained for fertilization. The other 23 chromosomes, the egg have thrown it into a small cell, which is a rubbish bin for the, for, for the other 23. Yeah? So that when the sperm gets in and fertilize the egg, the sperm will contribute 23 chromosomes and the resultant embryo will be 46 chromosomes. And chromosomes are housing for genes, all right? Now, of course, um, we can't treat the egg with chemicals like this. So we have to use light to shine at the egg so that we can see the internal structure of the egg. Now, what you see from here, what you see this on this slide, this egg externally looks healthy but internally, is it a healthy one? So when you use a polarized light, you can see the shine, the light will shine on this structure here, and it resembles the same structure what you see from here. Okay, and it's, and it's bright, so this means that this egg has a high potential to give you a good embryo and lower risk of miscarriage. Now, this egg here, again, looks healthy, but is it a a healthy one. So what you see from here, the, the, the separation of the chromosomes in this case is not complete and embryo that derived from this egg is genetically not healthy. That means very high risk of miscarriage. And some eggs externally, you see this one is very nice, but internally this uh, spindle, what we call it, has been broken into pieces. Yeah, And again, the resultant embryo will be genetically abnormal and high risk of miscarriage. So we are, in summary, we are selecting the, the egg 
based using on this uh, colorized slide, and we inject, uh, we select sperm with high magnification, and we grow the embryos to blastocysts. Now, this slide here shows you how the, the different stages of embryo development. Now, this is that shows you the 24 hour interval of uh, how the embryo develops. So, let's say the, the eggs collected today and uh, inseminated today, and the next day, where, when the lab will update the, the patient how many eggs injected, how many fertilized, what you see from here, this is a picture of a fertilized human egg. So the two round things here, one comes from the egg, the other ones come from the sperm. So each of them has 23 chromosomes. So they unite and merge and then they form a nucleus. Now, the 24 hour interval, the next day, this is the targets of the, em the embryo should reach to reach the blastocysts for five days. Now, what, what we are doing now is that we are growing the embryo in a time lapse. Now, most of the time, that's what it, information most of, most of the IVF labs, they're still using a box incubator to grow the embryos. And depending on their protocol, they may have to do every morning, to take out the embryo, put on a microscope, check on them and put it back. And each time you expose the embryo out from outside the, to the outside environment, it will cause more stress to them and they may not able to reach what we, the final stage of uh, day five blastocyst. So, what, what we have now is that we have been growing this embryo in a time-lapse incubator whereby there's no need for us to open up the, and check the embryo because we can see how the, the egg or embryo uh, developed from day zero to day five of embryo development. That's because you, what you see here, the egg is growing in the well. On top of it, there's a camera and this camera every 10 minute interval will take a snapshot of the image of the egg or the embryo. And at the end of the embryo development, it composes into a video so that, the, so that the embryologist can review the video and decide and give a score on the embryo and decide which embryo will be, will be uh, transferred first to give you the, good, the best outcome. So let's say for instance here, you grow the embryos to the blastocyst. Yes, it's very nice but we want to see whether it's a good one, then we have to play back the video. So I'm going to show you the video now on how the embryo is, de is developing. Now the egg has been injected with the sperm. And what you see the appearance of the, the uh, pronucleus from the egg and then another one from the sperm. And this is the time here, yeah? And you see that both of them will merge and then there will be a mixing of the chromosomes from the sperm and the egg, and then they start to split into two. Now, every time each cell will have to split into two. All right, and this is the time here. And what you see later on, by about 42 hours, you have to be given a four cell embryo. Now, 42 hours means that it's shorter than 48 hours. This will so also indicate to you that the embryo is healthy because it may not need a lot of corrections in the beginning to start with. And also you look at the uh, uniformity of the cell structure. It's all uniform uh, size. So it indicates to you that the embryo is going to be a healthy one. Now, from the, from the third day onwards, it's going to grow into the fourth day. And this stage is very, very fast. That means that they are growing more and more cells. Yeah. And you will notice that the embryo, there's a cavity here. Now this cavity is going to expand because the cells are pumping a lot of fluid. And you notice that the egg shell is going to thin up. The purpose of the embryo, you know, expanding the cavity is to thin the egg shell so that it can naturally hatch out to implant into the uterus. So just to refresh, the, this one will give rise to the baby. This one will give rise to the placenta. So all of us came from this type of embryo. Yeah. Now, this is the picture that shows you the time-lapse incubator here. So all the eggs and embryos will be grown in this incubator. 
and we can review the each of the embryo on a video and this and and the score will be given to each embryo and with the embryo with the highest score will be the first to be transferred back to the patient now how do we grade the embryo the grading of the embryo can be based on one thing there are three units the size of the cavity is one to five the health of the inner cell mass that means that can give rise to the baby a to c a is the best c is the worst and the so this, uh, this outer cells here, they give rise to the plant placenta is A to C. So if you look at this embryo here, the grading is what we call a 5A A. That means the best grade. Yeah? Now in conclusion, the quality of the sperm and the egg have significant impact on the outcome of the IVF program. And the sperm selection methods have been devised to improve sperm quality, to select the best sperm to get into the egg, and egg selection also now, uh, embryo selection and blastocyst transfer has helped to improve the outcome of the IVF cycle. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Liao. Okay, so um, it was really a very eye-opening presentation on the science behind IVF. Thank you so much. All right, so, um, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, do continue to keep your burning questions coming in via the chat option um, at the bottom of your Zoom window. All right, you can either send them publicly or privately, and uh, we will try our best to address as many of, uh, of them as possible after the last presentation. All right. So um, moving on, we have also invited Mr. Edmund Pang, Principal TCM Physician from EMW Physiotherapy and TCM Clinic, who will be sharing with all of you on how acupuncture can help your IVF journey. Mr. Pang, please. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I'll share my, sc my screen. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so a very good afternoon again to everyone. I'm very honored to be here today, you know, to share on how to overcome fertility challenges through a modernized TCM approach. Now, uh, maybe I will just go straight to it. <clears throat> so there are three main factors you know, for a successful conception. Now, egg quality as what Dr. Liao has uh, mentioned earlier on, sperm quality as well as uterine environment. Now, of course, there are still a lot, a lot more factors, things like stress, as Sharon has um, shared earlier on, a diet, your lifestyle, exercise, your sleep. So um, other than that, no. So now the three main factors, how can actually TCM help? Before you go into egg quality, we look into how um, the follicular genesis process. Now, um, from ovulation, backtrack 190 days back. So this is the point where, you know, hormones and nutrients delivered by the blood supplies can actually play uh, a very important role in determining how good your follicles are because the environment that eggs actually occupy during their maturation process has an impact on what shape they are in before meeting a sperm. So they need a good blood supply. They need sufficient oxygen. They need adequate amounts of right nutrients, the right hormone signals, and the capacity to supply enough energy to the embryo. Now, this has very important implications, particularly for eggs that are coming from slightly older ovaries, uh, where AMH is low or FSH is higher, and possibly from eggs from women with PCOS and endometriosis. So now, the big question is how Chinese medicine or acupuncture can actually use and help you know to improve the internal environment so there have been a lot of clinical studies although they are still in the um, early stages studies have shown that acupuncture can actually improve blood flow uh, improve blood flow to the ovaries suggesting on its effects on quality of developing follicles this depends on uh, the outcome actually depends on duration of acupuncture treatment because if you are just starting uh, of course you cannot see the effect immediately you need like two to three months for the acupuncture as well as the Chinese medicine to take its effect. So uh, as well as there's a lot more studies have shown, you know, acupuncture has been shown to promote the growth of new blood vessels, stimulate uterine blood flow, leading towards an enhancement of the uterine receptivity, as well as to improve on the endometrial lining for those with uh, thin endometrial lining. So the concept of Chinese medicine is no longer just like, you know, yin yang qi xue, 
uh, those that uh, these terms are basically used in previous, uh, I would say maybe the previous generations. So uh, in terms of TCM regulation, we call it Tiao in Chinese. Basically, it means to balance your hormonal system, your endocrine system back to homeostasis. You know, when your thyroid hormones are on the higher side or TSH on the lower side, or you know, high estrogen or on the, on the other side of the story, low progesterone, low estrogen, or low thyroid hormones. This is where Chinese medicine and acupuncture can help to push and regulate your body back to homeostasis. That means to say your hormone levels are on in the normal range for a healthy internal environment leading towards a healthy um, and uh, firm and egg quality. So how can TCM actually diagnose uh, your menstrual health? That's why we spend a lot of time you know, asking patients how regular is your menses, your blood flow, is it scanty, is it heavy flow, the color, the viscosity, as well as any accompanying symptoms, tenderness in the chest, bloatedness, menstrual cramp, backache, as well as we take your pulse, we look at your tongue, and that's where we actually classify you into different, we call it body constitutions. And that's where we carry on with our treatment approach to build on, on how we can improve your internal environment. And when your internet environment is being improved, uh, that will help in your sperm and egg quality. So what does a lot of research also say, you know, those receiving acupuncture conceive, this is just one of the study. Of course, it's not to say that once you start on acupuncture, you can be pregnant within 5.5 weeks. It just means that acupuncture can help to expedite whatever lifestyle interventions that you have been doing in order to improve your sperm and egg quality, as well as to bring your pregnancy to a healthier uh, state as well as uh, TCM can help with your follicle development, things like endometriosis symptoms, as well as sperm quality, we'll go to that later. And as well as in terms of acupuncture, a lot of more studies have shown, you know, to help in terms of pregnancy rate, as well as reduce on miscarriage, uh, miscarriage uh, rate. And sperm quality, now spermatogenesis, 74 to approximately 90 days, this is where Chinese medicine, uh, we believe that can help your internal environment, you know, to produce better quality sperm, as well as quantity as well. And research, recent medical uh, evidence uh, shown that acupuncture can cause an increase in the beta endorphin. This helps with GN high secretion. That means to regulate the entire reproductive system so that, so that um, the internal environment where your sperm actually matures in can actually help uh, in terms of motility, morphology, as well as sperm count. So this is the part where a lot of uh, research has actually been shown you know, to help with sperm quality as well. So now the big factor is other than acupuncture and Chinese herb, how can we actually help ourselves uh, in terms of bringing up a better version of ourselves? First, we need to look into stress. Now stress is not just about emotional stress. <clears throat> a lot of my patients, they are treating that oh, stress, it means Okay, maybe I'll just go for a holiday, then be back pregnant. Not necessary. Because uh, work stress in terms of, are you spending, um, are you doing work in your own private time? If there is, there is also a stress because you cannot switch off whenever there is time to switch off. And you probably, you know, your meetings can be go all the way up to 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And probably just say that, oh, maybe I sleep at 3 a.m., I wake up at 11 a.m. So I still sleep eight hours. So I'm not suffering from a lack of sleep. No, actually it's not. You are suffering from a lack of sleep because when it's time to sleep, you are not sleeping. This, is, this actually creates a stress within our, our internal environment. So lacking um, lack of sleep, I'm sure a lot of us are part of it. You know, we tend to sleep at you know, 12 a.m., 1 a.m. and wake up at 6, 7 a.m. Although we might feel refreshed, you know, um, some of us might have better sleep quality, but the majority of us will still feel fatigued. Our energy level is still low, our vitality is still low, this couldn't bring you enough energy, you know, to have intercourse during the night or even to have, uh, allow your body to allocate enough resources and energy for better sperm and egg quality production. And secondly, we look at exercise. You know, either we do too much, that can cause hypothalamic amenorrhea in women. Uh, either we do too little, sedentary, that can go to obesity, uh, uh, I mean, in women with PCOS, I mean, that's quite co uh, often uh, commonly seen, as well as uh, chronic pain. There are certain times where we actually experience pain, but we just choose to neglect it. You know, uh, things like we might be suffering from fibromyalgia, and we, um, 
this pain is actually causing us a lot of stress, mental stress, emotional stress. This can actually change our entire lifestyle and perception towards our life. If you are suffering from that, how can we, you know, have the proper energy to even propagate a family? And the fifth is chronic energy zombies around your surrounding. It can be in your office, it can be in your family, it can be in your any other environment. And usually these are the factors. What do I mean by chronic energy zombies? It means toxic relationships around you. So this actually sucks a lot of, uh, sets a lot of energy from you that actually you just feel tired standing beside this particular person or environment. So this is something that you should actually look into it as well. Six poor diet. Now, a lot of us, you know, we are looking into a lot of American diet, things like keto diet, intermittent fasting. Well, there's, there's, no, there's nothing negative about it if you are diligent and disciplined in abiding it. However, if you are not so diligent, sometimes you take breakfast, sometimes you don't take breakfast, this creates some kind of confusion within our internal digestive system, our gut health, and as well as sometimes we skip meals, we skip lunch, we skip dinner for certain reasons, or even late meals. So whenever I ask my patients, do they take regular meals? They say, yeah, I do take regular meals. So what time is your dinner? Uh, my dinner, I take it around 9 p.m. Well, so is that regular? No, it's not regular because we are born in such a way that we have this syncardinal rhythm within us. So this actually uh, regulates within our body, you know, to produce gastric juices within certain timing due to uh, hormones like leptin and ghrelin. So these are the hormones uh, responsible for our digestions. Uh, digestive system. So this is something that we need to look into it. If it's when it's time to eat, you don't eat, this is actually creating stress within our body. Lastly, holding grudges against someone, undigested emotions. This can actually suck up a lot of energy within us. You know, uh, as Sharon uh, mentioned earlier on, when we look into our Facebook, our Instagram, we just scroll and we see baby's picture. If you are feeling stressed, you do know that this is causing you stress. And if that's the case, Either you switch it off or you don't do it, you, do, you, you don't look it through all these pictures. So this is something that we can actually help ourselves, yet we are actually, um, we are actually putting ourselves in that environment that causes and self-sabotages our own road towards fertility. All right, so uh, last but not least, what we can, uh, what uh, in my practice we provide with patients with, preconception care therapy, that is one of you know, commonly known as fertility massage. Now, other than just massaging, we, we also do kwasa, we also do uh, ear seat therapy. This is something that outside probably, uh, they, they seldom have this kind of services. This helps to regulate our endocrine system. It helps with our sleep, it helps with, it helps with our mood, it helps with our digestion. So if we can you know, get all these things in balance, and uh, if our digestion is working well, you need nutrients for your good quality egg, right? You need nutrients for good quality sperm, as well as good uterine environment. So um, by helping all these systems around, putting all these systems in place, we can actually help with fertility as well as acupuncture and herbs. Now the herbs that we provide here, they are HSA approved and they are hala and they are saturated. That means you don't need to brew, you don't need to cook them. You just take it, put it into hot water and drink it. Okay, so last but not least, there are 10 simple ways you know, to start honoring your hormones. Now we are all human beings. We all have emotions. Okay, so we respect our own emotions, we respect our own human body. First thing you have to respect is your natural sleep pattern. Okay, uh, so sleeping between 9 to 1 a.m., that is the maximum you should go. And 11, before 11, that, that should be the time that you know you should be looking into it. It's not 12 p.m., it's not 12 a.m., it's not 1 a.m. Unless you have certain things to do, you know, you are working, fine. If not, if you have nothing to do, you are spending your last two hours of your day scrolling through Instagram and Facebook, that I'll suggest you can better use that time, you know, to get your body some rest. Enjoy regular movement and take some time, you know, to understand your body as well as your diet. Clean food, wholesome food. You know, a lot of us, we are eating on the go. We are always rushing for time. We are always taking process. We are always taking instant stuff, instant fast food, instant noodles. These are the things that are not going to give you good quality eggs and sperm. Okay, and spend time in the nature, reduce environmental toxins. I'm sure all these things, we are, we are aware of it. However, we choose to ignore it. We choose to find the best supplements on the internet. We choose to spend so much time Googling and Googling and Googling, yet we are ignoring the fact that you are who you are. 
your person, I mean your human body and your mental health should be the thing that you should be spending most time with. Okay, so uh, advice for me. So the moment you are ready to quit is usually the moment right before the miracle happens. Okay, so don't give up, especially I mean when you know you still have a lot more to try to learn as well as to expose yourself to. I mean, until the last end, you know, we can, we should always persevere on. So with that, I end my speech here. Thank you very much. Pass it back to you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Mr. Pang. Thank you so much for the very inspiring quote and for sharing also as to how traditional Chinese medicine can complement a couple's IVF journey. All right. So um, last but not least, our last speaker for the day is Dr. Roland Chang, founding medical director of Virtus Fertility Center Singapore, who will be sharing upfront with you on how fertile are you? Dr. Cheng, please. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Uh, Stephanie, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, okay. So I'm uh, trying to get this up. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Thank you very much for being here for this afternoon session. Uh, this is the first time I'm uh, delivering uh, sessions uh, in this manner. Uh, previously, we have been doing this uh, with a face-to-face -face, uh, meetup. And um, you know, I always been looking forward to those sessions whereby we get to meet everybody in person and really get to uh, know each other um, you know, and also know about your concerns. But never, nevertheless, I think uh, this is also a good way because uh, I think um, you know, you can learn a lot of things informally because um, I'm just listening to the previous speakers. I think there are a lot of uh, good tips that we can um, get from all the previous speakers. Now, coming to uh, the, the last session of the day, I just want to talk to you a little bit more about how to, you know, achieve natural conception. As much as possible, uh, we have seen too, too much of the lab and also, you know, Edmund, I think I talked uh, told us extensively about uh, how to keep us ourselves healthy and what about you know the real the real deal whereby we need to actually have to try and uh, you know have have that activity being increased uh, in, in frequency and try to get it to happen now um, today's uh, this afternoon I'm just going to bring you through the following areas awareness first of all awareness of your natural fertility how fertile you are what are the indicators for infertility that you need to be aware of and how to optimize your fertility? Some of the coital practice that we all know very well, but are they really useful? And of course, uh, you know, um, we talk about some lifestyle factors. What are the evidence that shows certain lifestyles might be good? Some are not, not so good for us. And of course, uh, well, I'm going to conclude with some take-home messages for how to achieve natural conception. And I will just briefly take you through the step-by-step that we inverters that we are stressing on in I, for IVF treatment. Now, first of all, natural fertility. Um, natural fertility is uh, creating the capacity to produce offspring. Um, unfortunately, it is not something that you can put a measure to it because until you started trying, you never know how fertile you are. And in fact, it really differs in different individuals. I mean, I'm sure all of us, we heard uh, our friends, our, our somebody who, who are close to us, who told us, oh, uh, we are actually not quite ready, but the moment we stop our contraception, ah, we get pregnant. So it, it seems so simple sometimes, but you know, to, it, to some other people, it's just not so straightforward. You keep trying and trying and trying, it just won't happen. Now, by and large, I think uh, if you look at fertility, age is still the major determining factor. The younger you are, the better it is. So we always encourage uh, as much as possible, you try to, you know, um, don't plan. Uh, you, they, you can never plan enough. So as much as possible, you try to get pregnant uh, as early as possible. Now, this is uh, enough uh, has been said about this. We have uh, shown many, many uh, by all the researchers and all that. We have a peak fertility at the age of 24 to 25. That means you are the most fertile at this period. However, uh, this peak fertility became halved at about you know age 38. So you can imagine if let's say you are naturally not so fertile, this can be quite a problem. But of course we can say that oh uh, you know I might not be that in, that that bad. I might be quite fertile. But the, the, the main question is as we said earlier, you do not know how fertile you are. So that's what 
make it very difficult here. Now I've shown this chart many, many times. I think uh, a lot of people have also shown it. Nothing unusual here. The, the blue line tell us about likelihood of infertility. So this is the advancing age. Chances of infertility keep going up. And of course the likelihood of getting pregnant coming down. So you see, you know, by the time you reach about 45, 40, 49, the chances of the chances of getting pregnant is probably only about 5%. So it is, uh, it is uh, quite appalling here. Now, how about the chances of natural conception if you look at month-to-month, uh, -month, cycle to cycle? It is rather stable from cycle to cycle in the same individuals. Um, highest in the first month of unprotected sex. That's why, you know, the moment you stop your contraception, chances of uh, uh, getting pregnant is rather high if there isn't any other issues. However, once you do not get pregnant in the first few months, then it starts to come down uh, gradually. Now, it doesn't get any better because the current trend, we have a lot of issues, especially in a place like Singapore. We all of us are working so hard. Uh, things getting more and more expensive. Life getting more difficult. We also, um, not uncommon that all of us uh, delay starting a family. Uh, career education demands. We still want that PhD. We wanted the financial stability, not enough to pay the car. We waiting for stable relationship. And of course, some, some, sometimes, uh, you know, there might be a second relationship whereby the first one had failed. Now, coming back to infertility, it is a disease. It's well recognized as a disease now that it is defined as a failure to achieve a successful pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected intercourse. Now, um, end of 12 months, the main reason is this. Um, the way how we define the timing is that at the end of 12 months, we expect 85% uh, of the of the normal couple should be pregnant, and at the end of twenty four months, another uh, ninety two percent, so small increase thereafter, and thereafter it doesn't go up anymore. So eighty five percent chance of getting pregnant, meaning that there is only fifteen percent, uh, just by chance that you are you are unlucky that you are not pregnant. So therefore, you know there could be some underlying factors. So that's how we define infertility. Now, infertility indicators, I always find it very useful because, um, you know, as much as possible, we want to know what are the possible reasons behind the failure to conceive. And by doing that, you know, we can maybe target our treatment more efficiently. Now, um, I identified mainly three factors. One is a male factor, sperm coming from here. Um, tube factor, whereby the sperm and the eggs get to meet. Eggs coming here, the sperm coming here. And of course, whether there is a AIDS being released. So these are the few uh, infertility indicators that I frequently will talk about with my patients. Now, if uh, somebody who has an ovulation disorder, that means the eggs are not coming out properly, frequently it is very obvious you have, uh, you know, periods they are a bit abnormal. Uh, you might have uh, two monthly, three monthly menses. Um, that means that your ovulation is not so frequent. Um, Male factor, whether there's any past history of semen anomality, but this uh, is uh, a bit of a more difficult here compared to the women's side, because the male factor, you really need to test the semen before you can tell. Now, tubal factor, history of whether there is any tube uh, operation, history of any previous pelvic infection, or any major operation involving the abdomen, such as uh, operation on the colon, operation on the stomach. Now, all these major operations commonly might affect the tube. There's another factor for endometriosis, uh, uh, whereby it is, uh, it is uh, um, typically has severe painful menses, painful intercourse. Um, of course, there is any previous operation that has confirmed endometriosis. Now, the way how we, I look at all these infertility indicators is in this way. I think all these indicators, even if you do have any of these issues, it might not mean anything until you have, have a certain period of trying like six months or a year. Now, even for somebody who had confirmed to have endometriosis, endometriosis itself does not mean that you are infertile. Okay, having a tube problems also does not mean that, you know, it, it, the, the tube has not uh, repaired itself or healed over. And uh, of course, as long as for the male factor, as long as the sperms are there, in fact, I keep telling everyone that um, you should still continue trying because the chances for you to get pregnant is still there. And of course, Ovulation, even if the ovulation is a bit infrequent, it does not mean that everybody will need help. As long as you have your ovulation on and off, it might still be, uh, it might still be 
uh, uh, possible to, to achieve pregnancy. However, if you have any of these indicators, it means that there might be a high chance that, higher chance that you might have some issues. So usually I encourage them to keep trying for about six months. If I say there is no success, we probably it's time to look at uh, uh, having some tests and investigation. Now, how to optimize your, nat your chances, natural chances of getting pregnant? Now we talk about, I'm going to talk about sexual activities and frequency, the fertile period, some of the coital habits that we know of, and of course, some lifestyle factors. Uh, first of all, sexual, sexual intercourse, how frequent is enough? Uh, frequent ejaculation decrease male fertility. Is that true? Um, it has been found and shown that men with normal semen analysis, if your semen analysis sperm, sperm count and all that is normal, even with daily ejaculation, the quality remains okay. Okay, quality remains all right. Um, however, with men with low count, with daily ejaculation, the counts and motility actually improve. So whether it's normal or low count, whether there's any abnormal uh, semen analysis result, um, seems to be the frequent ejaculation, uh, frequent ejaculation and sexual intercourse is, cannot be you know, uh, over-advertised. So therefore, um, daily sexual intercourse seems to be okay. There was this uh, research that has been done, uh, many other research as well, but this particular one has shown that uh, daily session of course, 37% pregnancy per cycle, alternate day, 33%, once a week, then only it drops to 15%. So um, you can go for daily, alternate day, but they are similar. So that will be okay. So it, think, it seems that alternate day will be fine. The general recommendation is that the chances will increase with frequency. The more frequent you have a sexual activity, the more likely it is going to be successful. Okay. And of course, I always stress this again and again, that your own preference is most important. We should all avoid strict schedule, you know, strict uh, 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 routine, because uh, that the stress level is uh, totally unnecessary and it can be detrimental. Now, how about fertile period? Now, we all like fertile period assessment very, very well. Uh, you know, we have the test kit. We want to know when we are ovulating and all that. So usually this is assessed by looking at the body temperature, very nice uh, elaborate uh, body temperature chart out there. You have a um, cervical mucus assessment, counting the number of days, LH kit, companies making a lot of money from selling this, and, and some, some, some of our patients can test multiple times a day, uh, to, just to predict the day of ovulation. But however, I think if you look at it um, 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 carefully, why are we doing all this? Are we doing all this to, to minimize, to, 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 to reduce, to possibly making our sexual activity more efficient? Probably not. I think it has been shown enough that, you know, in order to improve your sexual, um, you know, your, your chances of conception, sexual intercourse needs to be just more frequent. And furthermore, I think the most importantly, they are not reliable 100%. And the main, main negative uh, factor here is that it induces unnecessary stress. So I always say that, you know, if you are going to test your ovulation often enough, chances are you're going to see, you know, less and less of your, of your husband. So this is indeed quite frequently happening. Now, why, why did I say that it's uh, not 100% reliable? Now, if you look at the menstrual cycle, the only part that is, uh, that is a constant about the menstrual cycle is really the part after uh, the surge. Now, after the surge, you get ovulation and the leftover after the, of, the, of the egg, after ovulation becomes what we call corpus luteum. Now this corpus luteum has a fixed lifespan, which is determined by this, which is supposed to last for about seven days or so. And thereafter, this corpus luteum will start to, what we call disappear, disappearing, slowly it becomes smaller and smaller. Now corpus luteum is very important because corpus luteum is a source of progesterone. So progesterone is the one that, the one hormone that maintains the lining from breaking down after ovulation. So you can imagine if let's say the corpus luteum start to disappear, the lining start to become unstable and or when the level drops below a certain critical level and that's when the lining starts to break down. So only from here to here, from the onset, from the time of surge and to the onset of the menses, it is rather constant. However, this part of the menstrual cycle is extremely variable. And this is the one that could actually be affected by emotion because as we all know that 
this part of the cycle, what we call the follicular phase, depends very much on your body P2-3 production of FSH. And this FSH uh, is again is being determined by your hypothalamus and hypothalamus what we call the higher center. And higher center is very much controlled by your emotions, your, your daily, acti uh, daily activities, lifestyle. So that's why we keep saying that stress does have an impact. This is the, the part because uh, it could just go too long whereby your FSH is just never enough and you do not get the switch, all right? So that's, um, that's why, you know, all these uh, assessment of uh, LH kit and all that might not be that reliable. And sometimes the switch might not be even be high enough for you to pick up in the urine. So let's say you're doing your LH kit, it's totally not reliable because it all depends on uh, how much of urine you're producing, what, uh, what do you have in your diet and how do you, you know, whatever that you take, uh, will affect the excretion of the hormone. Now, there are simpler methods to assess um, whether you are ovulating or not. Um, by and large, this is, uh, this is uh, extremely reliable. If you look at the vaginal secretion uh, on the day of intercourse, if you have slippery and clear, you are fertile, that's it. Now, why is the secretion slippery and clear? Now, the secretion slippery, uh, is it slippery and clear because this is in response to the estrogen. Now, if you look at, again, the follicular phase, you have uh, growing follicles. Growing follicles will give rise to rising level of estrogen, and estrogen will stimulate the gland to produce this secretion. However, once you have the surge, and the surge becomes significant, the secretion will be affected, and so therefore, it will become drier, it becomes sticky, and that's when it is affected. So something as simple as that, you don't have to spend a cent just to find out you know, whether you are fertile or not. Now, these two charts are rather interesting. Um, the first one here, talking about probability of pregnancy with a single act of intercourse. Uh, if you, I think the message here, the most important here is that throughout the entire menstrual cycle, any part of the menstrual cycle, there is a probability that you might get pregnant. However, it seems to be highest maybe just before ovulation. Okay, day 14, maybe just before ovulation. There is a certain peak here. But again, you notice that there is a, it is rather e uh, even on both sides of the peak. Now, this is a probability of pregnancy by cycle day involving recurring intercourse. Uh, the yellow chart is a younger lady and the blue chart is a 35 to 39. Rather similar, again, uh, maybe the peak is about minus one or minus two to ovulation. Day relative to ovulation, day zero is the ovulation. So again, you need to have uh, your sexual activity before ovulation. Now, by the time you start to find your LH in the urine, you know, this could be over. You could be over here. It could be post ovulation already. So it is really not necessary to do that. And there are a lot of other things that you can do. Uh, what about coital habits? Now, these are all the things that uh, you can find, you know, people talking about. Um, you know, how important it is, you know, after sexual intercourse, you can make sure that you, you, you put a pillow under you, you got to stand on your head. Uh, so these are the usual things that, you know, make sure that or you, you could be successful, more successful in this, in this manner. But none of these are really reliable and necessary. I think if it's going to be important, I think none of us will be here already by now. Remaining supine with pelvis tilted upward after sexual intercourse, certain sort of coital position is better for conception. Orgasm is, uh, is uh, essential for fertility. Um, uh, what about the, the coital practice in terms of uh, infant gender? So none of these are really reliable. Now, how about the use of lubricants? By all means, I, don't, I never discourage use of uh, lubricants. In fact, I keep saying that um, you know, if there's any, any need to use any lubricants, do not hesitate and please feel free to, do any, to use anything you want, as long as you feel that you know, it's hygienic enough. And, of course, there are some research that are done on the pre-seed and all that supposedly they are, they, are, they are better for sperm motility. I don't think that it's that important, all right? So I think if you want to use, by all means, you can go ahead, no harm done, but there's really no limitations on any type of lubricants that you might want to use. Now, about other lifestyle factors, I think uh, in this chart, uh, this is a chart, uh, produce, uh, I think uh, this is a study done in Australia. Now, there are a lot of uh, other issues like toxins, solvents, illicit drugs, and all that. But I think, by and large, uh, what more applicable to us in Singapore, maybe obesity. But our BMI is hardly more than 35. So, um, in fact, uh, our center, we have a limit at 32. 
So anything more than 32, we always want to, you know, wait a little while, see what else can be done to bring down, bring down the weight. Uh, we send to Edmund, ask Edmund to help out. So these are the, these are the uh, usual things that we try to do. And the main, main purpose here is try to get you to be more fertile. Uh, underweight, we seldom have this issue, but there are occasional cases. Smoking, rather frequent. And alcohol, not so much. Caffeine, well, caffeine, I would say, if it's more than 250 milligrams a day is uh, quite a lot. I think here we are talking about uh, maybe uh, five to seven drinks, seven, seven, seven shots of uh, espresso a day. So that would be maybe a bit too excessive. All right. Now, smoking is a big concern. Smoking. Uh, women who smoke more likely to be infertile. Menopause occurs earlier. Higher risk of miscarriage for both uh, are both uh, spontaneous and uh, IVF pregnancy. And of course, the most important here is that, you know, the lab telling us again and again that, uh, you know, uh, smokers, uh, they just feel different. Sometimes the membrane feels soft, jelly-like. So there is a big impact on the success rate. And the, 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 the uh, effect is quite significant. Now, just to summarize the important messages for natural conception, age again and again, uh, we talk about age, the younger you are, the better it is. Now, infertility indicators is really not so much uh, for you to be worried too much about, but rather uh, it serves as a, as a red light. You know, maybe you have tried for a while and you do have any of the indicators, probably it's time to, you know, seek a treatment early or assessment early. Now, frequent intercourse is um, most important. Every one to two days will be, will be sufficient and this alone can yield the highest pregnancy rate. The fertile window. You have, uh, you know, we define the fertile window, six days interval ending on the day of ovulation. So, um, but the, the most tricky part here is that we do not know when exactly is the ovulation. So six days, you, want, you might want to count, but it's, it's rather, rather difficult. So usually what I, I told my patients is that, you know, um, you can, once your menses start, you give it about a week. And one week after, maybe day eight onwards to, for another week, that means the second, second week that is probably the time of uh, best time to try for sexual activity in order to get pregnant. So if you divide your, um, your menstrual cycle into four quarters, the second quarter is the most important timing. So as simple as that. There is no specific coital timing position or, or you know, uh, that has any impact on the, uh, improving fertility. Um, so as I said, uh, you know, the, 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 the four quarters is soon after cessation of your menses, it's time to have sexual intercourse. Uh, devices designed to determine or predict the time of ovulation may be useful for couples who are infrequent in the course, but uh, you know, there are a lot of limitations. And I think uh, the main concern here is the into introducing stress into the, the, the process. Smoking should be discouraged for all couples who are trying to conceive. Now, the last part, I'm just going to bring out a little bit about uh, IVF. Uh, when, when, what is the indication? Now, you may be trying for a while, you are not able to be successful. Now, when do you need to consider IVF? Uh, first of all, it's the duration of trying to conceive. Now, how long you've been trying? I think, um, you know, only the couples will know themselves. Uh, you have to be aware of the age effect. Now, if you are older, we probably will not want to encourage you to try too long. Emotion effect, now you might be young, you might be 20, 28, before 30. Of course, we say that your chances of getting pregnant is extremely high. But if you have been trying for two years, three years, and there is no success, I think the emotion starts to set in. So you know best when is the right time. And do not, do not, I keep telling everyone that we should not be putting IVF as a last resort. That's because, you know, if you, are, if you are 30 years old, you want to try till you are 40 years old, then you start doing IVF. That is not the right thing to do. Um, medical indications and unsuccessful treatment. If you have any in, um, medical indications or any previous unsuccessful treatment in terms of the male factor, acute problem, ovulation factor, then might be the time for you to consider IVF after some attempts here. Now, there are also other indications. Some people might need the, the uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, whereby you need to bounce your embryo to prevent certain congenital diseases, for example. Um, what about recurrent miscarriages? You've been you know, having unsuccessful uh, pregnancies, uh, multiple pregnancy failure, and you just want to save time, you want to get pregnant uh, more, um, more quickly, so it might be important to start IVF as well. But by and large, I do have this request, um, people who are des desiring for twins, 
and also they want to you know choose gender uh, gender certain gender but this is uh, currently not allowed in Singapore so I will discourage you to do that and certainly not for twins as much as possible IVS is still reserved as a form of medical treatment now the other the other questions that we usually ask ourselves is uh, um, what is the success rate how successful can IVS be now I always say that these are the following most important factors to decide how successful you can be um, the number one factor is how old you are. So I, I always say that together with the lab, Liao and all, we say that if you are under 30, I think more or less, we can guarantee that you're going to be successful. Um, next factor is uh, whether you had any previous pregnancies, be it successful pregnancy, delivery, miscarriages, any of these uh, situations whereby they had been implantation previously, you stand a good chance. Medical indications, um, if you have uh, you know, sperm, severe sperm factor, tube factors that are clearly being uh, overcome by IVF, it will be very successful. However, if you have previous IVF failure, that might be a negative impact, might be having a negative impact on your success rate because uh, you know, most of the time there could be uh, uh, concern about whether there's any implantation issue. Now by and large, ovarian reserve, by no means it is an indicator of how fertile you are, but however, in IVF, your ovarian reserve is extremely important because if you have a good ovarian reserve, chances are we would be able to get more embryos from you and so therefore your chances should be better. Similarly for the sperm condition, you are going to more likely to be able to get better quality embryos. What about complications? Is there any complications in IVF? I think um, today if you look at IVF, it's such a you know, well-controlled uh, process now. I would say the complications, the old days complications like multiple pregnancy doesn't apply very much anymore. And uh, the other complications that we have, what we call OHSS, ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome, we don't see it for a very long time. I think since the beginning of the, of the, of the center, we have not seen any severe OHSS. Um, so really, I think uh, it is of a uh, uh, complication of the past. Now, safety of the medica uh, medication, immediate effect, you are concerned about drug safety, the procedures of the egg collection and embryo transfer, all these are relatively low risk procedures. Usually each one of them probably take, take about uh, 15 minutes or so, or five minutes to 10 minutes. So uh, it's an extremely safe procedure. It's a day procedure, you get it done, you go home on the same day. And sedation, uh, sedation for the procedure, mainly for the egg collection. So sedation is also rather safe. Now long-term safety, long-term safety for IVF. I think IVF has been around now for coming to 50 years now. Um, cancer risk or risk in the IVF children has not been well, uh, has not been established. So chances are it is going to be quite safe until you know, new evidence start to show. But I think at the moment, there isn't any uh, reason to not to use IVF. Uh, this is my last slide. I'll just go through step by step. So this is what we mean by step by step. From here, from here till here, probably takes about two months. So starting, there might be a, if you have the time, um, we might want to go into some pre-IVF preparation, make sure that your pelvis is okay, sperm is well optimized. And then at the time of your menses, you give a bigger clinic a call, and then we'll be starting medication and injection at the time of your menses. And this follows after blood test, ultrasound, and these injections will carry on for about 10 days and egg collection on day 12. Okay, so part one, IVF done. This will follow by egg collection on day 12 and carry on with embryo culture, brassosis freezing, and that's it, this part one of the treatment. After that, you go into part two, so you can actually you know, decide when you want to start embarking on that. You can we'll review your menses at about one week after a correction, the earliest possible. Ultrasound, blood test again, and then we'll start some oral medications. And these are mainly just estrogen to build up the lining, so to get ready for implantation. Now this medication will carry on for about again ten days, next ten days, and then you'll have an assessment. If the assessment shows that the lining is adequate, you'll you have your embryo transfer done, and blood test for pregnancy will be done two weeks after. Okay, so rather straightforward. So by doing this, we found that it's uh, quite important because uh, it is less emotional. It uh, feel, doesn't look, feel, uh, feel uh, so difficult to go through. All right, so uh, just uh, last word about our virtual fertility center. We've been here since uh, January 2015. 
Now, from the very beginning, we have uh, started off well. I must say, um, we have stayed on on course to maintain good success rate and outcome, and uh, maintaining the success rate, not just to achieve the success rate. And of course, we have been focusing uh, heavily on our four main pillars of care: uh, the clinician, embryologist, our nurse, and as well as our counselor. So um, maybe we are looking at the fifth uh, pillar now after today, huh? Uh, we're going to incorporate TCM here because uh, I think TCM um, incorporation has also significantly contributed to the success. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, back to you, Stephanie. And all right. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Cheng, for the very, very insightful presentation. And uh, thank you for all of you for sending in your uh, questions. Okay, so we are actually early for Q&A, which means that uh, we actually have got time to answer all of the questions. All right, so uh, maybe let's start off. Okay, so I received this private message asking, how long should couples try before seeking help? Well, I think this one has been pretty much covered in uh, Dr. Cheng's uh, deck. I'm just not sure whether um, uh, we have fully addressed your, your concern. But if, let's say you, you still have got other um, um, similar questions, do feel free to drop them in. All right. And uh, the next question is, um, okay, does abortion lessen the fertility rate? Um, can anyone, uh, would anyone like to address this? Any speaker? Does abortion lessen the fertility rate? Um, uh, generally, no. Uh, if you have a procedure done, whatever procedure, of course, there might be some uh, complications uh, coming from the procedures. But abortions are generally considered safe, so that should not be a considered an issue. Should All be right. should be okay. In fact, in fact, as I as I mentioned earlier about previous pregnancy, uh, as long as you are being pregnant, that puts you in a better light. Positive. Right. Okay. Um, the next question is PCOS an indicator of infertility? That's me again, I think. Seems <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like uh, so far all the questions are for you. <laughs> uh, again, again, no. Um, so PCOS uh, is uh, indicated by infrequent menses and, of course, uh, some androgen factors. But not all, not all PCOS are infertile. So if you, if you look at the, uh, the condition, the condition actually has a wide spectrum from the most severe condition to the less severe, whereby the most severe, you don't have any menses at all. But of course, the chances of a pregnancy is not there. However, for those who are not so severe, whereby your menses is just a bit prolonged and you do have ovulation but just infrequent, you are not considered infertile. I see. Mm. All right. Okay. Um, the next few questions are still related to you, I guess. Okay. Oh. So for, for the rest of you who have got any questions pertaining to um, our um, 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 scientific director's uh, PowerPoint presentation or even our counselor or even our, our TCM physician, please feel free to uh, drop them in. Uh, but meanwhile, let's continue with the Q&A. So someone is asking, uh, Dr. Cheng, uh, would you be able to clarify the fertile window? Uh, meaning to say the best week. Yeah. She wasn't able to capture the information that was conveyed earlier on. Ah, okay. Mm. So, so I, was, uh, I was saying that uh, you, you look at your menstrual cycle. If your menstrual cycle is 28 days, for example, you divide into quarters. So the, 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 the second quarter is the time for you to track. The first quarter presumably is for your menstrual flow and the second quarter is for you to track. But, but however, this does not work. If, if this only works if you have regular cycle. If you do not have regular cycle, I think you, know, you just have to have a regular sexual intercourse. And that would mean that the timing, the best timing would be immediately after your menses is over. I see. Okay, uh, next up. So uh, what is the age of the oldest patient who has used her own eggs for conception? Yeah, and also uh, if a woman is very old and still menstruates regularly every 28 days, uh, can she still do IVF using her own eggs? Um, we, I can't say very much, but um, you see what happened is that the ruling was just been changed uh, since January. Was it January? January this year. Thereabouts. 
Yeah, so they have removed the age limit of uh, age 45. Um, so we can't really say for sure, but I think um, um, chances of pregnancy after 45 is extremely low, but never zero. So if, it is, if you feel that uh, you know, it is necessary to keep trying and you, you are aware of the, of, the, of the potential of the success rate, I think you should carry on, you should push on. I, as I always say, everybody has their day. <laughs> All right. And uh, also, does our center perform fresh transfer or only frozen embryo transfer? Well, um, I don't think it is, uh, you know, the verdict is still out there. Uh, but as far as our, our center is concerned, we are very, very much uh, more comfortable with frozen embryo transfer. Uh, not to say that we won't do frozen, uh, fresh embryo transfer. It's just that I feel that the result is so overwhelmingly different. We just feel, uh, you know, you know it's, it's just wrong to offer you fresh embryo transfer. Now, that's not to say that you would not do fresh embryo transfer. Okay. Hmm. So um, the other question is uh, with regards to the age limit for IVF, but I think uh, Dr. Cheng has already earlier uh, shared as well. So um, moving on. Should IUI before IVF be a preferred plan or are both of them the same? Well, um, IUI has been around for a very long time, very, very long time, even before the, the, the start of uh, IVF. And IVF has been refined repeatedly and the IVF success rate has been improving all the time. Um, from the time of uh, uh, starting stimulation for multiple eggs, suppression, IVF has improved so much. However, IUI it was first started as a, as, a, as a trial method, more in, a, in a animals. So it's mainly for those uh, you know, situations whereby uh, you have uh, animals that refuse to, 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 to have sexual activity, so you can't get the offspring. So there is uh, some, some uh, you, know, um, you know, that's how it was all started. Uh, however, now there is enough evidence, because IUI has been done for so long, there is enough evidence to show that IUI compared to natural conception natural sexual intercourse, it is not superior. Now, I think this not superior is quite important because uh, it is still, after all, a process, a medical procedure. So if you are going for a procedure and yet it has been shown to not to be superior, then I think we should not use it. Now, of course, there are indications uh, for IUI uh, for couples who are not able to have, uh, you know, they have very infrequent cycles or have some ovulation issues IUI might still be useful because it is not so easy to say that, okay, it's time. You have to have your session in the course tonight. All right. So it's not so, not so simple, not so straightforward. So we understand that, as I keep saying, stress is a very important factor. So that's where I would say IUI is probably useful. Now, IUI is also useful for some couples. Somehow, for some reason, they have some kind of a sexual dysfunction. They are not able to have, to achieve sexual in the course. So IUI will be useful. Uh, because, um, you know, we would not want to keep trying to treat their sexual dysfunction until they are very old. So normally, I would say that I always keep telling them that, you know, if I, can, if I could give you a baby, you will treat your condition. So those are some of the indications for IUI, but otherwise, uh, by and large, IUI has very limited indication today. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, there's a follow-up query from... Uh... Um, another viewer here asking, uh, does it mean that couples should try from day eight onwards based on a regular 28-day menstrual cycle? Mm, because you exactly. mentioned about splitting in the quarter. That's so right. from day exactly. eight onwards. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, someone is asking with regards to the cost for one IVF cycle. Uh, pertaining to this, right, we will actually address to you separately. Uh, you might want to drop us a, a, a query via our website and we will actually... Uh, send you the relevant information with regards to the cost for IVF at Virtus Fertility Center. Okay, and uh, another question is, uh, I'm not sure whether this one would any other speakers uh, be, be able to address, uh, but will vitamins or supplements help to increase a couple's fertility? And if yes, what are some examples? We ask Edmund that. <laughs> Edmund, okay. Ah, we so, ask Edmund that. Yeah. <laughs> Any vitamins or supplements get, that can help to um, increase a couple's fertility? Uh, Edmund, uh, we, we can't hear you. 
Okay, um, actually, I would say uh, we need to know what kind of deficiency that we have in our daily meals, you know, to start popping in supplements. You might be having a well-balanced diet, then you probably won't need any more additional supplements. Supplements should only come in if your diet, you know, is very unbalanced and you don't really eat good meals. However, in, if you are, you know, undergoing treatment, if you are planning to do IVF, Number one thing that you should be looking in is to looking for a balanced diet, not just supplements. You can search for the best coke, <laughs> the best DHEA, but you know, diet still plays an important role. All right. Okay. All right. Thank I, you so much. I, and, I, hmm. I, I totally agree with uh, what Edmund said. I, I, think, I think a lot of the time I have no objections uh, against any uh, supplements, vitamins, but a lot of the time we are more concerned about sometimes the impurities or whatever processes that uh, were, were being employed to prepare them. So especially they are all coming from various sources. So I think the, the, the really the safest way is really to minimize if possible. Mm. I totally agree with both of you. <laughs> Always better to get your nutrition through good food <laughs> and don't waste your money. <laughs> Improve your lifestyle. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Great. And uh, also, um, how can a couple actually, how can the how can a woman increase her egg quality and quantity? Is there a way? Maybe naturally. Um, egg quality is really something very very difficult. I think from our experience, uh, number one, before IVF, uh, you have uh, gone through your IVF, we will not be able to tell a person's egg quality. Mm. Now, on, most of the time, the egg quality if it is poor is all discovered after one or two cycles of IVF. Uh, number two, I think uh, you want to overcome egg quality issues. My advice is start early because that seems to be the most important factor determining egg quality. Right. Mm. Okay. And uh, the other question is, can a couple with unexplained fertility, infertility get pregnant? Of course. So, <laughs> <laughs> so unexplained infertility, it is a real entity and it is very well defined. And uh, such that um, it, it means that all the available investigations and all that into male factor, tube factor, and ovulation and all that has failed to show any abnormalities. So that's when we determine as uh, unexplained. But frequently, as the investigation continues, there might be something else being found. For example, some patient who might be termed as uh, unexplained infertility after a laparoscopy, the whole story changed. So laparoscopy means that you have a look at the pelvis and all that. It could be badly scarred because of previous infection. Yeah. And the other issues about inf uh, infertility, uh, unexplained infertility is that uh, frequently it is, um, it is uh, associated with uh, egg, egg, uh, egg quality. So that can be a concern. So I always uh, very wary about unexplained because uh, this group of patients, if they go through IVF, they seem to have slightly lower success rate. So it is of uh, some concern. Now, if you look at the, the, the guidelines, uh, medical literature guidelines overall for unexplained infertility, the general treatment previously, there were three. So one is to try longer. Two is uh, SO, super ovulation and IUI, insemination. But currently, this has been dropped. And the third one is IVF. So now, if you have unexplained infertility, you're only left with two options. Keep trying, IVF. Okay, um, I have got two more questions over here. So somebody is asking, um, okay, she wants to know, um, she, okay, hold on. Uh. Okay, she would like to seek clarification with regards to ovulation test. So she wants to know whether is it really accurate or just to a certain extent. So also for <laughs> Dr. Ching. <laughs> uh, uh, so if, if you have regular cycles, and I, I have, uh, we have well, gone through this uh, previously. If you have regular menstrual cycle, 28 days, 30 days, you really don't need the testing. All right. I think uh, testing is probably more useful for somebody who has, uh, you know, a bit irregular cycles. You do not know when you are ovulating. But I, I always maintain that. Why, why are you testing? Are you trying to minimize effort for the, for the, minimize effort for the, for the benefit? So I think we should, should not be looking at it in that way. If there's anything at all, the, the, the effort should be into having more sexual activity, more free, more, have more time together instead of testing, you know, repeatedly. All right. 
I agree. Okay, uh, so far, one last question. Okay, so um, this person is a male in his 30s, a uh, mid-30s, and his partner is also in her early 30s. Um, so the husband doesn't smoke, doesn't, uh, and seldom drink alcohol, enjoys a healthy life, um, takes, the husband takes blood pressure medication so um, every morning, and uh, he's asking whether would they have a higher chance of having a kid via IUI. I think, yeah, instead of IVF. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, most of the time, my advice will be if you are able to have uh, achieved normal sexual activity with proper ejaculation in, uh, inside uh, and frequency is adequate, you don't really need to look at IUI. So there is enough evidence to show that IUI does not give you more benefit. And no, also sex, blood pressure uh, medication doesn't affect... Ah, uh, so blood pressure medication, normally, if you are young, it doesn't affect you too much. But of course, some of the blood pressure medication might affect your sexual desire, libido, and of course, in overall, your sexual function. So if that's the case, that is a problem, then maybe IUI might be able to help you. Mm. But remember, bear in mind about another thing because uh, you, you have to look at it in this way. Uh, IUI, you need to attend, attend a session at a medical session, at a medical clinic, and you, you do it one month, once a month, okay? And uh, unless you are doing every month repeatedly, otherwise uh, you, are, you are only having one chance a month. But if you are trying on your own, you are actually exposing yourself repeatedly. So in a way, you know, um, it's, it's not really, if you look at it, it can't be more efficient than natural sexual intercourse. Okay, great. Um, okay, there's a question. I think this is suited for uh, Dr. Liao. So, uh, so someone is asking, can women who cannot find a life partner at this time store their eggs? Um, yeah, so maybe Dr. Liao can um, address that question because she read the Sunday Times uh, with regards to fighting for fatherhood that low ovarian okay. reserves are reason for egg storage when a woman is young and cannot find a life partner. Well, um, well, uh, currently what's happening is that the uh, Singapore is not, doesn't allow uh, what you call social aid freezing uh, because uh, some, they have some uh, policy, but I think that the, currently the government is reviewing that policy. It may take some time, but uh, aid freezing is only possible for medical reasons such as the woman you have to go for chemotherapy and all those things to preserve her fertility. So in this sense, uh, egg freezing for social reason is not uh, available at the moment. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So it's not I, can I, Yeah. Can I just add a few things? Um, I think egg freezing it is a uh, established uh, method now, established procedure. So I think um, uh, we should not be shying away just because the policy disallow it. Um, the the fact is it is efficient, it is effective, and it is advisable. So I would say that, um, you know, of course now in Singapore is the disallowed. You cannot freeze your egg uh, socially just because you have low, so, low egg reserve. However, if you do have egg, uh, low egg reserve and you are younger, younger means below 35, I would strongly advise you to get your egg preserved because I think it does have a significant impact on you. Now, we are talking about a situation whereby you are not uh, looking at starting a family yet or you don't have a partner yet. So you should really look at seriously preserving your age. Okay. So so there's a way to preserve, uh, but there's no way to preserve eggs in Singapore, right? Unless you That's have right. got a known medical condition, yeah, such as um, cancer or something like that. Yeah. 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 So until <laughs> until CB is set in, we are supposed to be well traveled. All of us are doing <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have this question for Dr. Chang. Okay. So um. This inquirer, she has had two IUI and four failed IVF cycle. If she wants to plan to do another IVF cycle, what can be done to improve her chances of um, conceiving? Um, okay, um, we would have to look at uh, all the circumstances around your previous uh, failed cycle. And uh, we have to probably look at it and decide what is uh, any intervention or any treatment that is uh, necessary in addition to just starting an, another cycle. All right. 
So it, it is possible. I think the number of cycles does not really matter that much. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, your success rate is determined by whether you have any previous IVF success or IVF failure. So if you do have IVF failures, you are supposedly more negative, but by no means you have no chance. So what we do, we, we actually at our center, we see a lot of uh, such couples. I think uh, frequently I discuss with uh, Liao uh, looking at the, at the IVF uh, treatments previously and we will have a strategy and a program uh, design how to overcome any certain uh, possible factors. Okay, um, there's a question for Edmund. Okay, Mr. Pang. Okay, so um, there's this question. So this lady was told by her Chinese physician that a woman who is above 45 years old and trying for a baby uh, should not take Tong Kwai and ginseng. Is that true? Yeah. Okay, uh, a short answer would be yes, you can take both uh, Tong Kwai and uh, ginseng. Oh, still can take. Okay. Yes, but it depends on whether your body constitution is suitable for it because it's not suitable for everyone. I think what the Chinese physician is uh, trying to imply is whether when you are pregnant, can you take Tong Kui and ginseng? Yes, that answer would be no. Okay, so when you're pregnant, after, uh, then after you stop taking Tong Kui and ginseng, but while you're trying to conceive, probably you belong to this group of patients is qi deficiency, and that's where you need uh, these two herbs. But other than that, then uh, I think that if it, your body is not suitable for it, you shouldn't take it. Hmm. Okay, very interesting information. Okay, so um, I saw a last question. Uh, this is posted to everyone. Um, is there an official organization in Singapore where we can find out about the regulations regarding Singapore versus other Asian countries? What is the official resource we can rely upon regarding all these regulations? Uh, well, I guess, I, um, are you referring to um, like, you know, some guidelines pertaining to IVF and all that? Uh, if that's I'm not sure whether the other speakers um, have other things to add on. Yeah, I think it's just the MOH website. Yeah, where you... Um, what is the... Yeah, yeah, correct. With regards to the age limit and all that. Yeah, all these news are actually available uh, just on the website. Yeah, so feel free to uh, check it out, okay, through a very simple Google search. Mm, you should be able to find all the relevant information over there. Well, as far as, as far as I know, I don't think there is any um any any other countries around around us that have any limit on social aid visits. Uh huh, Liao? I don't think yeah. so, huh? No, yeah. uh, because um yeah, aid freezing is practically uh, allowed outside Singapore. Hmm. I That's think it's only news. yeah, it's only the recent few years. I think it's uh, within the last ten years that uh, aid freezing has becoming very very successful. In terms of the yield after towing, you can really use the egg very well, and the success rate is extremely good. Uh, in you, uh, in you, um, as for age limit, now Singapore has remo removed the age limit, so I'm uh, I'm not sure whether that's uh, good or bad, but uh, I think it's in a way it is uh, very important because I think we should not deny anybody of the chance of a of a uh, pregnancy. So I think that's a good move. Okay, so um, all right. So if if there are no more questions, let me just take a look. Right, I think so far there are no other new questions. Okay, um, so we have actually come to the end of the virtual meeting. Uh, but before that, just I uh, have something to share uh with all of you. Okay, so um, can all of you see this? Yeah. So um. So basically, if let's say you are interested and have not undergone any fertility checks, our centre is actually offering a couple's fertility assessment at 299 before GSC. And uh, you may find out more details from our website and uh, do drop us an inquiry anytime. Okay, and we'll address to you accordingly. Um, and uh, we hope you have found today's virtual meeting useful for you in planning for your fertility journey. You will receive an email on Tuesday to complete a feedback form pertaining to today's meeting. Um, and we would really greatly appreciate if you could all submit your responses to us so that we can better improve our meeting in the next round. All right. So uh, once again, once again, thank you so much for having spent your precious Saturday afternoon with us. Okay. Um, hope to see you again. Take care. All right. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.